same-sex marriage, any, any discrimination against gays in federal hiring. Don't ask, don't tell is no longer the law of the land. All of these issues are at the forefront today as the LGBT community lays out an aggressive equality agenda. But within the LGBT community, there is a quiet but steady drumbeat at the same folks fighting for equality across America ignore equality within, with their black LGBT brothers and sisters. Here to discuss the inequality within the LGBT movement is Dr. Darlene Nipper, Deputy Executive Director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, Cleo Monago, CEO and founder of Black Men's Exchange, and Earl Folks, President and CEO of the Center for Black e Equity. Folks, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a discussion that over the years, I've talked with a number of brothers and sisters who are gay who said, Roland, these things are happening and folks are afraid to talk about it publicly because just like black women in the civil rights movement, they say things are happening, there's progress, we don't want to slow that down by having the conversation. Do you have that same uh, belief that it has been uh, talked about but nobody really wanted to talk about it publicly and put it out, out there to, to sort of stop the, stop the progress, if you will? It's my perspective that the, that the gay community, <clears throat> excuse me, or the white gay community, as I call it, because I think the whole thing is pretty predominantly gay, a lot of black people do not want to be publicly associated with that community. Why? So they don't claim they don't complain about the racism in it because that means there will be a, a public association. So, they, so this community, as a result, from my perspective, is one of the most racist communities in terms of there being very little challenge to how they operate over over time. It's a particularly racist community. Earl, what do you and, think about that? Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that most black LGBT same gender loving. Uh, people do not live in the white gay community. We live in the black community. Mm -hmm. So our identity, majority of the people I know, all over the country, our identity is with black folks. We live in black neighborhoods, we do, we're a part of black institutions. The white gay institutions are in the neighborhood, we're not welcome there. And so that's always been the situation. Um, it has changed a little bit, but not a whole lot. I was talking to Jasmine Koenig a couple of years ago. She wrote a column where she was highly critical of uh, a white gay male comedian uh, who uses this Shirley Q. Licker character. Mm -hmm. Really plays this New Orleans mom with lives in public housing, a whole bunch of kids, wears blackface, talks ebonics. So she writes this piece and she got blasted on her own website. They call her the N word, all kinds of names. And she said, Roland, I'm raising an issue why gays didn't want to talk about it, shut it down. And she said, I got blackballed as a result. And she said, and there, here is something that I'm offended by, she said, as a black lesbian, but white gays and lesbians said, how dare you criticize somebody we think is funny? And she said that was a, a, an example of, she said, this struggle where I'm trying to raise an issue and folks will say, look, you should just be quiet and because the guy's funny, just let it go. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that there, again, there are pervasive problems both within and outside of the LGBT community. And, uh, you know, I, I love Cleo. And, you know, we've known each other for a long time. Yeah, he's not, he hasn't been uh, shy about challenging but, the infrastructure. But, but, but I think that is our exact role. That is our role to challenge the infrastructure. But, but, but what I say is that we all need to do this, and we all need to do it from the places and from the angles in which we actually can oper operate effectively. So I think that many times I've been um, inside of the very predominantly white um, mental health community. You know, my role in that community is both to do the work that I'm doing in the community to affect all of the people that I'm working for, and in particular, obviously, to affect, affect African American people because that's a community of which I feel that I am a part. I mean, as, uh, as Sharon Letman likes to say, I'm black too. The National Black Justice Coalition works to to ensure that black uh, uh, LGBT people also get to sort of uh, raise their issues within the context of the movement. And I think our work is to be at those intersections because the reality is there are black people who are LGBT, there are LGBT people who are black, and all both of the communities need to address the issues effectively. Cleo, you haven't been shy about it. You talked about many of these organizations have virtually all white staffs, don't have diversity among those staffs, and, and, and the black perspective is missing. And so when you have these, so for instance, I was talking to a gentleman in Chicago, and he said, many white gays don't understand when they talk about, oh no, we're the same as the black civil rights movement, and black folks, he said, he said I'm a black gay guy going, hey, why don't y'all ask us how that sounds to African Americans when you say it? Is not being, not having enough black folks at the table and listening to, listen to those perspectives part of the problem in terms of not understanding, uh, to your point, Earl, we're black. We get it, and this is the community we live in. 
Well, I have a different perspective. I mean, I think that what you're raising is important in terms of being at the table, but I'm not interested in spending a lot of time at that table because, I mean, I think that the kind of resources that come to that table should be trickled down into black communities, but our community has to learn how to love itself and embrace itself as black people who are same gender loving. And we have a lot of... You say you don't use LGBT, you prefer same gender loving. Yeah, to me, the LGBT construct is what it is. It's this, it's this white construct that we're talking about right now that tends to be predominantly white, that tends to benefit mostly white people and tends to include and invite white people and discourage black people to talk about issues that are relevant to them as black people. I'm not interested in trying to adapt to a community that encourages us not to deal with our own issues and that dismisses our own issues perpetually. So the work that I do is, is, is in the, inside the confines of the black community and trying to get black people to learn to normalize, address, and engage the fact that same gender living people exist, and, and to make up for, for that, that long gap in affirmation and support that we've had that's led to lots of casualties. I mean, the, the, the inability to resolve HIV AIDS going 30 years in, which is a resolvable issue in theory, is still off the chain because we keep on going through a white door to, go, to get to black people instead of going right to the black community. But what do you say to the African-American leaders and the African-American community about those issues? I, I agree with your point, and I, and I think that you should choose to do what works for you. But my question becomes, where is the responsibility of the African-American community and the African-American leaders to whom you, which I agree, I agree that both communities need to take leadership on these issues. So I understand holding the LGBT community accountable and, and not wanting to be a part of it. That's great. My question is, how do we hold everyone to the to to task? Well, because fir- all of us. Well, your first to be able question to- was, how do we hold the African American leaders accountable? That was sure. your first question. Yeah. And I think you should know that my work, ha- because it's been contextualized in the black community context, has attracted the likes of, of Louis Farrakhan, who invited me to speak in 2005 at the Million Man March commemoration. Um, it, has, it has involved people like Al Sharp. It has involved people like Molifi Asante. It's been, because the work is culturally resonant with black people, all kinds of black people have come to be engaged in the conversation. The white gay context has not attracted to our community because of its racism and its white, perpetual white face. We, well, don't, feel, we don't feel any resonance with it. And, and I think the leadership is, or the community. This is another, this is another problem where we, and I do it too, you know, where we make these communities as though they're monolithic communities. In fact, obviously, there's a lot of diversity within the African-American community, and there's an extraordinary amount of diversity within the LGBT you know, community, but, but regardless you know, of the reality you know what, of, of Darlene, what the issues this, are. This is uh, how I view it. You know, Rosa Parks, she, st- she decided to sit down in the front of the bus because she was, didn't want to stay in the back of the bus. So the roadmap has been set for me. I'm not going to stand in the back of the LGBT bus. I think that's great. And I'm, but however, I'm not going to stand in the back of the, the black bus because I'm a gay man. That, uh, that's and exactly so there's a point. balance. You know, we have to deal with homophobia within the black community and, and sexism within the black community. But we still have to deal with racism in the, in the, in the, in the white community. Um, and the fact is, oftentimes, the, the white LGBT community wants us to carry the water on homophobia in the black community without addressing the racism in, in the white gay community. Here's something interesting I saw happen with Trayvon Martin, and that is um, I, I see many LGBT groups, you call them essentially white organizations, virtually silent on Trayvon Martin. Call themselves civil rights organizations. Silent. No press releases, no statements. Mm-hmm. It took them a minute. Yet there are demands on black organizations. When are you going to speak out? On the issues. And I remember the New York Times did a story when there was a gathering in New York about the uh, stop and frisk. And the story dealt with uh, largely white gays who said, hey, we need to come out in support of this effort because African Americans in WACP had just um, uh, affirmed same sex marriage, had passed the resolution, and they said, we need, to, we need to come out on this issue. And I've heard from many blacks within civil rights organizations who said, man, they're wanting us to endorse uh, issues, but are silent on issues that we care about. And that also, I think, Cleo, has led to some of that friction as well by saying, wait a minute, you keep asking black folks, stand with us, be behind us. But then when black folks saying, where are you, then you're silent. Absolutely. I I mean, I think that's a very critical issue. And for me at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, what I love about the work that we do 
and the way that we do our work is that we actually are focused on the intersections. And so we were the leaders, not because stop and frisk, you know, because because someone was asking us we need to step up, but because we had built a long history of being involved and engaged with those organizations over, over a period of time where we have dealt with those issues for a very, very long time. And that's what's critically important. To I want to take a break. Issue. I want to pick up on that, though, when we come back, because, again, there are, it's, it's a huge issue among African-Americans. And I hear it all the time by sure. saying, wait a minute, you want us to be there, but you're not there for us. It, it, it can't just be one sided. So hold tight one second, folks. We'll be back in a moment.